<laughs> so Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, and I shared on Sunday morning, Paul is writing these letters in response to heresy. And that's what's going on. In Ephesus, heresy is beginning to rise up, and not just from anyone, it's beginning to rise up from among the leadership. Paul warned against this in Acts chapter 20. He told the Ephesian elders, from among your own selves, savage wolves will come in to devour the flock. And so now, here it is just a few years later, and Paul is addressing this to Timothy, and he's addressing heresies that are cropping up in the church there at Ephesus, and also some issues that will be taking place down on Crete when we get to the letter that he writes to Titus. But before we deal with heresy, and I shared this Sunday, we have to recognize that we have God as our Savior and Christ Jesus as our hope. And that gives me incredible peace because you don't have to fear heresy. God will keep his church. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. It's my church. And so for me as a pastor, I think, oh, thank the Lord. He's got this. I just have to trust him. We just have to lean into him. He's got it. And where heresy is concerned, the only reason it crops up is when we get away from him. When we forget that God is our Savior and Christ is our hope, and this is His Word, and we start to make it about ourselves, but I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Verse 2, he says, To Timothy, true child in faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus, so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration or the household management of God, which is by faith. And note this, it's key, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. What do 43 things, cluster funk, Diaspora and Elf Town have in common. 43 things. 43 things, cluster <laughs> funk, Diaspora and Elf Town. Anybody know? Oh, come on. They're social media apps. <laughs> you, you, you're not aware of those? <laughs> I actually had to look this up. These are part of the multitude of social media apps. There are so many out there. Is it just Google it? Social media apps, and you will just get a list. It's not just Facebook and Pinterest and, and you know, and the other, the Instagram. And I'm amazed by it because it's just, there are hundreds of apps, and there are several million users who are on these apps. And why are they on social media? Why do any of us use it? For connection. Because regardless of all the technology, humanity needs connection. We have to be connected to each other. It's the way we are. But the reality is, and we're discovering this, Instagram does not provide intimacy. And Pinterest is not personal. And Facebook is not friendship. It's ironic that you friend someone on Facebook because it's not friendship. <laughs> now, it can be used in a friendship, but if that friendship isn't grounded in, in face-to-face interaction and, and personal life, then it's just it's emptiness. Which is why if you're on Facebook, you know how easy it is for people to get into major arguments because they're kind of hiding behind their computer. People will post things they would never say face to face because it's not reality. In all of this, humanity, human beings, we desire, we long for real relationship. And it's the key, I believe, to Christianity. In fact, it's the beauty of Christianity. Because Christianity is not just doctrine. It is doctrine in relationship. That's how it works. That is always how it has worked. It's all about doctrine in company. Doctrine among people. Doctrine in knowing one another. We are far more willing to listen to someone that we know and trust than someone we have no idea who they are. And if we don't know who they are, but we know someone and trust someone who knows them and says, yeah, this person's good to listen to, then we'll listen. Again, it's doctrine in relationship. We don't teach in a vacuum. And just as the gospel is a message of meaningful relationship itself, because it's relationship with God and with each other, so meaningful relationship is what validates the gospel. 
It's what allows someone to hear what I have to say or what you have to say or anybody. If we're in a relationship, then we can start to speak into someone's life and we can bring that good news. And so that's why Paul begins this letter to Timothy, true child in the faith. They have a relationship. They know each other. They love each other. Paul will later call Timothy his beloved son, which is, again, something that God called Jesus. That's relationship. It's deep and it's personal. Timothy's life was changed because he and Paul walked together and served together and and lived together and did ministry together. And so Timothy then was discipled, and discipleship is relationship, doctrinal relationship. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, Paul says, The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Relationship. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, Paul says, You, however, continue in the things you have learned and have become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. I never noticed that before. Knowing from whom you have learned them. Paul doesn't just say, remember what you've learned. He says, remember who taught you. Because when I think about who taught me, it validates or legitimizes what I was taught. Or it delegitimizes it. It can work that way, too. If someone's a heretic and you learn something from them, you cast it out. You don't want to walk by that. Or someone does something really stupid and you learn from them. You think, wow, was that true what they taught me at all? Is that even worth living out? Paul says, remember where you learned this, from whom you have learned these things. He says that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And later Paul will refer to uh, Timothy's mother Lois and his grandmother Eunice who raised him and taught him specifically the Jewish faith so that when Paul came along all the background was there. And in relationship Paul begins to speak about who this Messiah really is and Timothy was ready because he had a relationship with these amazing women in his life who taught him the truth. And he could, he could trust in that. By the way, this is how I know we will not have robo-preachers in the future. Because we need relationship. Nobody's going to show up at a church. You know, I'll give you a different example even than that. When, uh, when Corey and Jason came to me and said, hey, can we do uh, a Thursday night down in Coopville? The original request, you guys remember, was can we videotape Wednesday night and show it on Thursday night? And... Um, Aside from the realization that I'm not sure there's a camera that could capture this. <laughs> uh, aside from that, my initial reaction was just, I would rather come down there. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the reason why is to be flesh and blood with flesh and blood is a completely different vibe than having a screen and watching some guy on a screen. Even if you know the guy, it's still it's distant. It's not real relationship. And so we're not going to have artificial intelligence teaching us in the church in the future. It's amazing because as our world is dying for genuine relationships, guess who has it? The church. We've got it. It's something we can offer to friends and family that they're dying for, looking for, can't find anywhere else. What, are you going to get it at Starbucks? I mean, maybe if you get amped up on enough caffeine, yeah, you'll talk to just about anyone. But this is where it's real and, and where we, we are called to keep it real and not to play, play uh, phony games. So we need the genuine article, and that's, that's behind these letters. It is doctrine in relationship. And doctrine in relationship will counter heresy and will point us to truth because we see doctrine lived out. We see the teaching. When I say doctrine, it's just teaching. We see it lived out in human life. It's experiential for us, and we can say, yes, I see it, I hear it, I learn it, and I see it in you. And it makes it that much more real. Which is why he says in verse 5, the goal of our instruction is love. Not head knowledge, not intelligence, not intellect, not prowess, not pride because we have more instruction than they do. The goal is love from a pure heart, love from a good conscience, love from a sincere faith. But here's the dark side. Heresy happens when that goal is replaced by egocentrism. When the goal of teaching for love's sake is replaced with teaching for pride. And Paul addresses that now in verse 6. 
For some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. It's fruitless discussion. What, what, what does that mean? That's, that's a nice translator's way of saying vain drivel. You know, empty chatter. Words that really have no import, no meaning, no depth to them. You hear them, they may even be exciting at first, but it doesn't get you anywhere. We're writing down here, and Jake said something. And it's so interesting you said this, Jake, because I actually shared the same thing last night. A little bit differently, but same concept. He was saying we went through, uh, we were going through First and Second Thessalonians, and we did four Sunday mornings talking about the rapture of the church which is always a buzz, you know, it's always exciting to talk about that and to look at, okay, what does the Bible say about this and what's legitimate and what is, what is literal in the scripture? And we went through these four different teachings on it. And then on the fifth Sunday, the last teaching in Second Thessalonians, I just went through Second Thessalonians and we covered four prayers with Paul. Not exciting by comparison, not a prophetic buzz, just Paul prays four prayers in, in that book. And so we just kind of went through those. For me, that was my favorite teaching of the five. Jake said the same thing. He said, that was the one. He said, the others were fun. But he said, that was the one that for me, it was like, it was meaty and full and rich. And, and, and I was just chewing on it after the fact. Last night after Bible study, I kind of stood up and said to everybody, a week from Sunday, yeah, September 17th, we're going to do a prophecy update. And we do those from time to time. Kind of look at what's happening in the world. Look at what Scripture says. But I told them last night, everybody looks forward to those. I don't. It's not my favorite thing. I would so much rather do what we're doing right now tonight. Just go through a chapter. Because for me, I'm just, I'm grounded. I find peace. I find security. I, I just, you know, it's just God's Word. And, and there's not a whole lot I can do to mess it up if we'll just keep going. Prophecy updates, i got to pull from a lot of sources, and, and yeah, we look at Scripture too, but there's so much buzz and so much hype, and especially right now, you know, just had a solar eclipse. A year or so ago, a couple of years ago, the four blood moons went by, and everybody's like, oh, oh, the blood moons, and Hurricane, you know, Harvey, and now Hurricane Irma coming up, and fires all over the western United States, and men perplexed at the roaring of the seas, Jesus said. We see the birth pangs, and people are kind of freaking out. And what about this, this whole pattern in the stars that's coming September 20th and 21st, which happens to be on the day of the Feast of Trumpets on the Israeli, on the Jewish calendar, and Revelation 12 talks about, oh, and everybody, we're going to deal with some of those things on September 17th. But for me, as exciting as that may be... 17th or 22nd? You said 22nd is the first time. Did I? 17th is the Sunday that we'll do the prophecy update. Yeah, yeah. And so on, on that day, uh, you know, it'll be fun. And, and hopefully we'll, we'll get back and get grounded to what, what does the word actually say. That's my, my focus. But still, the hype is not the thing. Being together in the word of God. Yes, looking forward to Jesus' return. But also living life in the presence of other believers and staying true to the word. That for me means so much more. All the empty chatter doesn't fill you up. God's word does. Why would these guys be so into uh, wanting? It says they wanted to be, or they were wanting to be teachers of the law. Why? I think the last two words of verse 7 give us the hint. Sayings and matters about which they make confident assertions. Which tells me what these guys want to be is the Bible answer man. They want the basically positional prestige. You know, to be able to stand up in front of a group of people and go, I got the answers, listen to me, check me out, and then after the meeting to have people go, oh, he's so wise, oh, he's so impressive. And I labored for that for years in ministry. I remember, it, 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 and it's a thing among pastors, hey, did you hit it out of the park this morning? Or did you suck? <laughs> I used that word in a teaching. I just did. Wow. Is that okay? Delete that later. <laughs> but that's the sense. Uh, as, a, as a teacher of the Bible, you know, you, you would get, as a pastor, stand up. Man, man, I was, I was banging on all cylinders this morning. Or, ah, I was just off. And something God taught me over the last several years at the bridge, teaching through the Bible, doesn't really matter if I feel on or off. 
And as a matter of fact, I've told some of you before that the mornings I began to discover when I felt the most off and the least with it and the most boring were always the times that people came up and said, man, life-changing. And when I felt great, like, man, I was awesome this morning, nothing. No response, zero reaction. And God taught me through that, hey, Rick, has nothing to do with you. It doesn't matter about you making confident assertions or being some kind of Bible guru. Just teach my word. And it is his word that I think really draws us. Uh, a guy by the name of William Mounts has a commentary, a really good commentary on First Timothy. And he says, speaking of these guys, these Bible answer men, these, these egotistical, prideful men who are dangerous in Ephesus, he says their desire is exceeded only by their ignorance. <laughs> And this theme of their ignorance continues throughout the pastoral letters. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 4, Paul writes, He is conceited and understands nothing. But he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words out of which arrive, arise envy and strife and abusive language, evil suspicions, constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth. And these are the savage wolves that Paul warned about. Acts chapter 20, you can look it up. Acts 20, 29, Paul warned the Ephesian elders and he gave what I believe was a prophetic word. After my departure, savage wolves are going to come in among you, from among your own selves. He spoke that four or five years now have gone by and that's exactly what's taking place in Ephesus. So Paul, by the Spirit, knew ahead of time, this is coming, this is going to happen. Savage wolves. Savage wolves in sheep's clothing. Understand this, and I think it's an important distinction. Savage wolves in sheep's clothing are different than dirty sheep. I was asked just this last week. We have a situation with a person in the fellowship, and I was asked, do you think this might be a savage wolf? And my response was, no. See, savage wolves are teachers who purport to teach God's truth, but they're teaching lies. It's not someone who's dealing with a major sin issue. We all deal from time to time with major sin issues. When we do, we're not savage wolves. We're just dirty sheep. (laughs) We got the wool dirty. We've been rolling in the mud. And what does a dirty sheep need? He needs a shepherd to come clean him up. He needs the washing of the water with the word, as Paul says in Ephesians 5. He needs other sheep to gather around and, and, and lead back into the pasture. Which is why when sin happens in a fellowship of believers, the first thing we do is not cast someone out. The first thing we do is seek to restore if there is a repentant heart. And Paul will talk about that, actually. We'll get to that in a little bit. But there's a big difference between savage wolves in sheep's clothing whose intent is carnivorous. Their desire is to eat the sheep. That's different than sheep who just got dirty. They're not going to eat the sheep. They're not going to harm anybody else, but they're in a mess themselves. What do we do? We love, we restore. But that savage wolf, we drive them out. That is unacceptable. Savage wolves divide. Savage wolves, what did he just say uh, in in chapter 6? Have depraved minds and are deprived of the truth, and yet they're out there trying to lead other people. That's where the danger is. They're like babies playing with power tools. Can you imagine dads of small ones who walk into the garage and they've got the, the power tools going? You're, Rrr, hey, Dad, look at this. <laughs> <laughs> Off comes the head. I mean, that's dangerous stuff. And the ignorant one holding up the Bible and trying to give all these, you know, espouse some kind of truth that's not based on anything that's biblical, but based on their own ideas. That is dangerous. These guys are teaching a law they did not understand. Look at verse 8. But we know that the law is good. And Paul's saying the problem isn't Scripture. The problem isn't the Bible. We know the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious. Our brother John Linus sent me an email just this last week. John said, hey, I was reading verses 8 and 9, the verses we just read. And he said, it reminded me of this. And then he sent me this quote from John Adams. Listen to this. It'll stir you. John Adams said, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Why are we having constitutional crises right and left in America? 
It's not because there's a problem with the Constitution. It's because the people are no longer moral. It's because the biblical Judeo-Christian ethic that was once in our country, when the Constitution was written, it was written for a Judeo-Christian people. But if you take that ethic and that value out, if you remove the Bible from the classroom, if you remove prayer from the public education, if you remove it from the public square, guess what? The Constitution will not work because it is written for a moral people. I, man, I found that was fascinating. And it's right on with what Paul is saying. Hey, the Constitution's good, we might say, for good people. But for bad people, it's going to be messy. And Paul says the same here is true of the law, that to accurately handle our, our United States Constitution, we must first accurately handle this word of truth, God's Constitution. If we can't accurately handle this, we will not accurately handle any law made by man. And Paul would later remind Timothy of this very fact. 2 Timothy 2.15 Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth. And I think you all know, but the reality in your life is the more accurately you handle God's word, the more accurately you will handle life. You know, it's it said that a Bible is that's falling apart tends to belong to someone who's not. So the key there is the word of God. So let's accurately handle what he's saying here. Note this, first of all, in verse nine, he says, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious. OK, the law is not made for a righteous person. Who's a righteous person? I mean, I just said, we're all dirty sheep from time to time, right? The wool is not all that clean, or at least sometimes, I, if I look in the mirror, I see the messes. I see the dirt. Maybe you don't, but you do when you look in the mirror. The law was not made for a righteous person. Okay, so who is the righteous person? And the answer is, it is you. You are the righteous person if, in fact, you have put your faith in Jesus Christ. Because as far as he's concerned, you have been washed with the blood of the Lamb. Your wool is white as snow. You are perfect in the Father's eyes because, not because of you, but because of what Jesus did. Because you put your faith in Him. You've been washed in the blood. You are the righteous person. Guess what? The law is not for you. Oh, good. Because, boy, that whole Ten Commandments thing is getting a little weighty. Now I can lie and not work. No, that's not what I'm saying. If you are a righteous person, that is blood bought and washed by Jesus... The law is not for you. Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4, the prophet said, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. But the righteous, here it is, the righteous will live by faith. faith. The righteous will live by faith. Paul quotes it, Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So who's the righteous person for whom the law was not made? The person who lives by faith, not the person who lives by law. If you live by faith in Christ Jesus, the law is not made for you. Galatians chapter 3, verse 11 is quoted again. Paul says, now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. So why did the law come? The law is given for the lawless and the rebellious. That's why it was given in the first place. And Paul uh, explains that. Romans chapter 5, verse 20. The law came in so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Let me say something I, I failed to mention a moment ago. The law that Paul's talking about here is the Jewish law. It's the Mosaic law. Now you might know at the beginning, uh, or note this in verse 8, he says, we know that the law is good. That's the Mosaic law. If one uses it lawfully. In other words, if you can keep it perfectly, it's a perfect law. The law is perfect. The problem is, we can't keep it. And then he says, realizing the fact that law, and this is generic law, law is made, is not made for a righteous person. You don't need a law. If, if you follow the speed limit, you don't need the police to pull you over. You know, the only people who get tickets are the ones who are not following the law. <laughs> but 
not tonight. Tonight we followed and it was good. You know, so if you're not doing anything wrong, Paul says the same thing in Romans 13. Hey, the, the government is only a problem for those who are disobeying the law. If you keep the law, it's not a problem. And that's kind of the point he's making. It's really not for you if you're keeping it. But then that throws us into that horrible conundrum. I can't keep it. I love Israel. Many of you know this. And I am fascinated by Jewish things. I love studying and looking at and even uh, emulating some of the feasts. They can be a lot of fun from a Gentile perspective. Uh, if you're raised, born and raised a Jew going to synagogue, a lot of Jews I know hate it. You know, because it's just, it's a burden. I know one who said, Passover every year, oh, it was, oh, it was the worst day of the year. I'm like, really? We all think it's great. Well, yeah, you would, you're Christians. But Jewish people, not so much. I'm fascinated by all of this. The feast, especially their fulfillment in Messiah. But I do not understand pseudo-Jewish wannabes. I don't understand Christians who want to go back to the old law. Christians who want to do all the Jewish things. I understand doing a Passover meal at the church for fun and for information and understanding. We're going to do, in fact, note this on September 20th, which is a Wednesday night in a couple of weeks. We're going to do a Feast of Trumpets at the church. And talk about, what does that mean? What is Yom Teruah, Day of the Trumpet, which is Rosh Hashanah, kind of the civic view of it in Israel today. What is that all about? What does that mean? We're going to talk about that on that Wednesday night. And can I have a special night of it? That kind of thing's fun. And it's fine. But those who are going back trying to keep these things because they feel like, wow, I am more holy before God if I keep the Jewish feasts. No, you're not. Don't go back to the law. The law was not made for the righteous person. And if you are in Jesus, you are the righteous person. And why did God give the law in the first place? So that we would recognize sin. We would see rebellion for what it is. Paul said in Galatians 5.24, Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. I have faith in Jesus. I don't need the tutor. The tutor got me here, but I'm not still going to the first grade. I've graduated. I have now moved into the place of faith. Paul says, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, Galatians 5.26. So again, it doesn't mean the law is not good. In fact, the law is perfect. But it becomes superseded by this divine relationship that we have with God through Jesus Christ. And so Paul is going to go on now and list several examples of those for whom, listen, those for whom the law remains in effect. So we're not talking about believers blood washed by Jesus. We're talking about those who want to live based on their own goodness, their own righteousness. And here's the list. In verse 9 in the list, the lawless and the rebellious, the ungodly and sinners, the unholy and profane, those who kill their fathers or mothers, murderers, immoral men, homosexuals, and kidnappers, and liars, and perjurers, and whatever else is con contrary to sound teaching according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Now before you blow by that sin list of Paul, and before you dismiss it because there are some uncomfortable things that he points out in the list, before we move on to something else, there is more to this list than arbitrary, uh, rambling, easy target sinners. I, I shared last night, Cheryl always calls me on this because there are like two or three sins that are just, they're easy targets. There are two or three people in the media who are easy targets. You know, Oprah's just an easy target. I can, I can point her anytime. It's just kind of, it's almost too easy. And there are certain sins that are like that that are really easy just to point out. And, and so they'll come to mind and I'll use an example and I'll go home and Cheryl will say, easy target, easy target. I'm like, I know. You get up there and do it. <laughs> but here, Paul is listing out all these things. They're not just easy targets. There's a reason for every single thing that Paul listed on this list. See if you can figure it out as we go. The first part of the list, and it really comes in two parts. The first part includes the lawless and rebellious, ungodly and sinners, unholy and profane. So if you just go that far, all of those have one thing in common. 
They share one thing. Now, if you were reading in Greek, you would maybe jump out and say, oh, they're alliterations. Because every one of these words, as you read through them in the Greek, starts with the same letter. And so it has kind of a poetic sense to it as, as Paul is laying these all out. But if you don't need, read Greek, you don't know that. Something else you would notice if, if we were hearing it, as the Ephesian church would hear it, you'd hear these and go, oh, okay, we're on a rhyme scheme here. And then all of a sudden, the last word, the word profane, would just leap out at you. Because it does not sound like any of the other words. Rolling along poetically, and then bam! Profane. The word in the Greek is babelos, which is kind of a, an in-your-face word. Babelos. It means literally where the sole of the foot treads. We say profane. Well, how, how is that the definition of profane? If you're, if you're putting the word together, where the sole of the foot treads, uh, by extension, where a man goes. That's profane. And I hear the word profane and I think bad language. Because that's what I was told in elementary school. Don't be profane. Mm-hmm. I remember writing a bad word on the chalkboard one time when I got in trouble. <laughs> Can you even imagine? I was just being a little rebel. Teacher sent me to the front of the classroom, stand at the chalkboard with your back to the class, and I'm embarrassed and I'm angry. And so I wrote a word <laughs> in the dust on the chalkboard. And a kid saw it and ratted me out. I didn't even know what the word meant. So that's what I thought profane was. No, profane is anything that is not godly. It's where our feet go. It's where the natural man treads. It is worldliness. That is profane because it's not holy. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. That's the way of the profane. The natural man. Isaiah 55, verse 8. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. We might call that the way of the world. Well, guess what? The way of the world is not the way of the divine. It is not the way of God. 1 John two fifteen. John says, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father. It's from the world. <coughs> the world is passing away and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. And so in this opening salvo, I I told you this first half of the list, you have those alliterations, and then you have this bold word, profane, that leaps off the page, but the alliterations are not what these words have in common. The one thing that all of these things have in common, let me read them again, lawless and rebellious, ungodly and sinners, unholy and profane, they all have to do with a person's relationship with God. In this case, a person's relationship against God. A rebellion against God. Every one of these is rebellion against God the Father. You know what's interesting? Same is true of the first half of the Ten Commandments. Keep your finger here and go back to Exodus chapter 20. It's one of those very easy books to find in the Bible. Because it's the second one. Exodus chapter 20. And I want you to turn there. I'm going to go ahead and start reading um, while you're turning, but there's more that we're going to look at in just a minute. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Okay, so that's a direct God-to-man relationship issue. No other gods before me. Verse 4. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above, on earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands implied of generations. Mm -hmm. For those who love me and keep my commandments. Verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. 
Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And if you stop right there, what you just heard is doctrine in relation. Relationship. It's a relationship with God. And what he's teaching is not commands to restrict your life and movement, but how you can come into relationship with him. Beginning with, look, respect the name and, and don't make other images. Uh, serve me alone. And ending with, remember the Sabbath day. Why? Because in that day of rest, we stop and have time to think about God. To be in his presence. And in this first half, that's what he's getting at. Something else when we were chatting about coming down here is the whole idea of God's glory and why God calls on us to glorify him. From a human perspective, if I was saying, glorify me, you'd say, well, Rick is prideful and arrogant. But when God says, glorify me, he's telling us to do the very thing that will save our lives. He's telling us to do what makes our lives worth living, what gives us satisfaction and meaning. When I glorify him, it's right, it's good, it's good for me. God knows that, so he says, I want you to glorify me. Who oh, why? Because you're so prideful? No, because when you glorify me, you are better for it. And like I said earlier, it doesn't work with any other human being, but it works with God. So the first half of the Ten Commandments, fully relational, a love for God. It's, it's about establishing a love for all things that are godly and being focused on Him. So that, that vertical, if you will, relationship. Now follow along with what else Paul says on the rest of his list. You all stay, stay there in Exodus 20. And let me read down the list and you follow along. Listen to this. After doing this, he says, after the unholy and profane, he says, and for those who kill their fathers or their mothers. What does verse 12 of Exodus 20 tell us? Honor your father and mother. Now we have just shifted from the vertical relationship with God in the Ten Commandments to the horizontal relationship with humanity. And that's the rest of the Ten Commandments. He will go through, Moses goes through, and those commands are how we relate in, you know, in relationship with other people. And that's the division of what they call the Decalogue, the the Ten Commandments. But stay with that for a minute. Honor your father and mother. And here Paul goes so far as to say those who kill their fathers or mothers, well, that's kind of the ultimate dishonor, right? It's the word patrolois in the Greek. It's where we get our word patricide, which literally is the murder of a parent. So if... A, a younger person or even an adult kills mother or father. That's called patricide because you have now killed the pater, the, the father or, or the mother. Patrolois means it's a connection of two Greek words. Father and mother are kind of put together in patros plus lois, which means to beat or abuse. So literally, it's not just those who kill father or mother. It's those who beat or abuse or crush or try to destroy father and mother which is the exact opposite of the commandment, of the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother so that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. What's the next one in the Ten Commandments? What's what's the sixth commandment? You shall not murder. And, oh, interesting, that's the next thing in Paul's list. After kill their father and mothers, he says, murderers. So he's tracking this thing as we go down. He's paralleling the Ten Commandments in his list here. And he does it all the way through. You shall not murder. Now, what's interesting is that Jewish people will tell you this. The rabbis, the old rabbis taught this, that the Ten Commandments, that while the the 613 commandments of Torah law are for the Jews, it is the Mosaic covenant, it's God's covenant with the Jewish people. If they keep these commands, they can live in the land. But the Ten Commandments, the rabbis will tell you they believe, and I would agree, are for all humanity. The Torah is for the Jews, but the Ten Commandments is for all the nations. And truly, our own constitution that we were talking about before was based off the Ten Commandments. And I would agree, I think the Ten Commandments flow right into the love we have for Jesus Christ. And I think they flow into the relationship we have, both in our love relationship with God and our love relationship with each other. 
I think they're as valid for us as they were for the Jewish people when Moses came down the mountain. Wait, so you're saying we have to keep the Ten Commandments? No, I'm saying if you love me, Jesus says, you will keep my commandments. They will be part of how we behave. They will, our behavior will flow in those things. But let's go a little bit further. Uh, what's the next thing in the Ten Commandments, uh, number 7 in verse 14? You shall not commit adultery. You shall not commit adultery. In Paul's list, he says, immoral men and homosexuals. Well, that's not adultery. Yes, it is. Immoral men is the Greek word pornos, where we get pornography. Homosexuals is the word. Well, let me let me come back to that one. <laughs> you shall not commit adultery. Why does Paul equate adultery with pornos? With uh, and the word pornos means either a male prostitute or a fornicator. The word, generically speaking, means any sex outside of marriage. So why would Paul equate adultery? Because we understand adultery to be if you're married and you have an affair, you've committed adultery. But, and so do not commit adultery. Good, I haven't done that. We haven't had to be had sex outside of marriage. Yeah, but I didn't commit adultery at least. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. It's the same thing. What do you mean? What sexual immorality is, is any sexual behavior outside of the divine design, which is a man and a woman in marriage. Now, please don't hear judgment in my voice, because in our culture today, when, when I teach on a Sunday morning, I look out over a fellowship, and I'm, I just assume, not that, you know, I don't assume we have a filthy fellowship, I just assume, hey, the, the sexual immorality that has been experienced and expressed here is probably very similar to the statistics in our culture, which is many, many people. <laughs> so, I'm not speaking this with judgment, the beauty of the blood of Christ cleansing us is it does cleanse us of any sin if we'll put our faith in him. His forgiveness is pervasive. I always have to pause and say that because I will have conversations with people after talking about sexual immorality. People will come up and just be so guilt ridden and I'll be like, well, did you repent? Yeah. Well, why are you still carrying this? Well, because it was so bad. Well, yeah, so is any sin. But the blood of Christ is sufficient to wash all of us perfectly clean. So we trust in that. And, and because we trust in that, then I can speak a little more freely, I think, when it comes to sexual immorality. Man, sexual immorality is adultery, it's fornication, it's all the same thing. It's any sex, whether it's sex before marriage, sex outside of the marriage bond during that, as in an affair, um, sex after the fact with an unmarried partner, homosexuality, anything that is not the sexual relationship in a marriage between the man and the woman as ordained by God. Any of that is adultery. Oh, and by the way, for anyone who's like, well, good, I've never had sex outside of marriage. Jesus said, guys, if you even look at a woman with lust in your eyes, you've committed adultery. Too late. I grew up in Southern California going to the beach every summer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's it like to be a 17-year-old adulterer? <laughs> but that's the thing. And, and God is trying to call us to holiness and call us out of the, the worldly mentality that says it's no big deal. No, it is a big deal, which is why Jesus died. If it was no big deal, why did Jesus get nailed up to the cross and bleed out? That's a big deal. So all of our sin matters to that level. What about homosexuality and why does he include both pornos and homosexuality? Paul is being pervasive. Whereas the law, the Ten Commandments says you shall not commit adultery. Paul is making clear what adultery is. It's any of it. And he mentions homosexuality and by the way there is no way around this. I know what our culture says today. I know what the belief system is. I know even in the church, all of the old standards are falling and the new tolerance is the thing. But I'm telling you, there's no way around what Paul describes in the list of things that are lawless, rebellious, ungodly, sinful. He lists in there immorality as in pornos and homosexuality, which is the word arsenocoitus. Our word coitus means sexual intercourse. Arseno means a man lying with another man. So putting that word together, it's only used two times in the Bible. And those two times, both by Paul, 
But if you go back to ancient Greek literature, there is only one definition of arsenocoitus. There's only one. It's not variously defined. It is always a man who lies with another man as lying with a woman sexually. It's homosexuality. So people who say, well, the Bible doesn't really... It does say that. It really does say that. It's the most literal word you can find in the Greek language to describe homosexuality. Paul uses it twice. He uses it right here. He also uses it in another sin list, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let me just read it to you for fun. (laughs) Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, pornos, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, arsenocoitus, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. When we studied that, I told you, I'm I'm so glad he didn't stop there because we would all be dead. We would be done. But he says, such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. You were washed, clean sheep. The wool is pure, as white as snow. That's so wonderful. And what it means when he says you were sanctified... Get this, it means you no longer live that way. You've been saved by Jesus, his blood has washed you, so that lifestyle is no longer for you. It's no longer the thing that now defines your life. Hey, maybe it did. And maybe even today there are consequences in your life that you still have to face because of stupid, sinful decisions you made before. But guess what? You have been washed. You no longer have to do that. Such were some of you, but not anymore. Sanctification is fantastic because now I am free to live for Jesus and not to live for my old sin life. But if you want to live the old lifestyle, if you want to live an unsanctified life of rebellion, what you are effectively saying is, I choose to live by the law. That's what my standard is going to be. Not God's grace... I live by the law. I live by behavior. I live by works. You can choose to do that. In fact, any human being has the right. God has given us the right. You want to live by the law? You can. The problem is the law is unforgiving. And you won't be able to keep it. This is why we we continue to talk over the years about, you know, works and works-based Christianity. Man, you will fail every time. But grace and forgiveness and the love of Jesus Christ overwhelms me and changes my behavior. So I'm not worried about trying to do the right thing. I'm just loving Jesus and the right thing gets done. That's sanctification. The law will not forgive you. The law says regarding these sexual things, Leviticus 18.22, you shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It's an abomination, God said. And then Leviticus 20.13, if there is a man who lies with a male as those who lie with a woman... Both of them have committed a detestable act. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. And the irony is that people will say, oh, the the Old Testament stuff doesn't count. I live under the grace of Jesus. Well, under the grace of Jesus, arsenocoitus is used twice as something that is not to be done. But even so, those who say, well, yeah, but I live by grace, so I can be a homosexual and a Christian. No, you can't. If you want to be a homosexual, you have to be a homosexual under the law. And the law says you die for it. And that's it. I mean, there's no other alternative. If you live under grace, then you have to be one of those such were some of you. Yeah, I used to be a homosexual, someone can say. I'm not saying, but someone could. (laughs) Just wanted to clarify that. (laughs) I used to be a homosexual, such was my lifestyle, but I got born again. And now I'm not any longer because that was the old me. For those who say, no, I want to be homosexual and Christian. I want to be an adulterer and a Christian. I want to be a drunkard and a Christian. Man, go down the list. I want to do this and be a Christian. You can't. Because you were saved, you were washed, you were sanctified. Now I know that there are those who would say, well, I just don't accept that. Really? Who are you to talk back to God? Romans 9.20 The thing molded will not say to the molder, Why did you make me like this? Will it? I mean, the audacity 
that we have sometimes as human beings to look at God and say, you're wrong. I can do this. I can do whatever I want. You can, but you're choosing something. You are either going to choose the loving, gracious forgiveness of God through Jesus, or you're going to choose to live under the law. It's your choice. If you choose the law, you're going to die by the law. Or you can choose grace and live. It's a cop-out to reject Paul's teaching, or even the Ten Commandments, as archaic or intellectually intolerant. The real question we ought to be asking when we read these things in Scripture is, okay, what is really on the table here? God makes clear what is sinful, what's detestable, what's an abomination. What's he really getting at? What is on the table? I'll come back to that in just a second. But again, all sex outside of marriage, according to God, is adultery because it defiles the marriage bed. And so these aren't just arbitrary accusations. Paul is tying all of this rebelliousness back to the very law itself. Continuing on, the next thing that that Paul says, and this is in uh, 1 Timothy 1 verse 10, he says on the list after those who are immoral men and homosexuals, he says, and kidnappers. Kidnappers. Okay, so what is the eighth commandment, Exodus 20, verse 15? Close. You shall not steal. You know what kidnapping is? It's the theft of human life. And in each one of these, what Paul is doing is he's taking whatever that law was in the Ten Commandments and he's taking it out to its worst extreme. Kidnapping, in, in Greek mentality, the Greek understanding of kidnapping was you are stealing a human. So it is theft. So we're still right on track with the Ten Commandments in Paul's list. The next thing that he says is, and liars and perjurers. The Ninth Commandment, Exodus 20, verse 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Paul's right on track. Liars and perjurers are those who bear false witness. The worst example of a false witness is what we have in the trials against Jesus. Because it was false witness that got him convicted in the Jewish court and sentenced to crucifixion. The tenth and final commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, is you shall not cover, covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, his ox, his donkey, anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now Paul, this is the one commandment that he doesn't specify, but what he does do is make a similarly broad statement. So you get down to the tenth commandment, and, and what the Lord does through Moses is kind of make a broader, look, don't, don't go after things that are not yours to go after. Don't covet in the, in the broader scale. Listen to what Paul says. He says after saying all this list, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. What that tells us immediately is everything on the list is contrary to sound teaching. So again, if someone says I can be a homosexual and a Christian, okay, but it's, sound, it's contrary to sound teaching. Mm-hmm. Well, I can be profane and be a Christian. It's contrary to sound teaching. I can be an immoral man, and I can be a kid, I can be a liar. It's contrary to sound teaching. That word sound, great word in the, in the Greek, it means healthy. It's used 12 times in the New Testament. Four times outside of the pastoral epistles, it's used. And every time it's used, it means physical health. It's talking about like a healthy diet or healthy food. When Paul uses it eight times in the pastorals, he always uses it related to the Word of God. That God's word is good, healthy eating. It's the best diet that you can have here on earth. If you want to have good health, where the law is concerned, if you want to be in good health, here's the deal. Don't keep the law. You want to be healthy? Don't keep the law. I don't know if you do this. This is what I do. If I find an area in my life that is unhealthy, I go to the opposite extreme. Don't have enough fiber in my diet, I'm out eating trees. (laughs) <laughs> you know, you, you go to the extreme and then you make yourself unhealthy because you've gone so far in the other direction from where you need to be. You know, you need to work out more. So 24 7, seven days a week, I'm out working out, you know, and, and just tearing myself up. Well, huh? It, uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> but we do, we go to the extreme. You can't go to the extreme with grace. You know, you can, you can feed on law and try to live by law, and it's not going to be healthy. But sound teaching is the teaching of the gospel. 
the teaching of grace. It's healthy, it's good for you, and you cannot get enough. And by the way, that is what's on the table. I said a few minutes ago, instead of looking at all the negatives and saying, why is God such a, you know, a killjoy? Wait a minute, look at what he's offering. Look at what's on the table. You've got all of the law over here, and you can fight to try and, and maintain these things, or keep these things, or reject these things. Or on the same table, you've got grace. You can receive the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. doesn't mean that you're going to always act perfectly. You won't. But you will be more and more righteous with every passing day the more you walk and live in grace. Because again, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It is the natural outflow of loving Jesus. That is what's on the table. Uh, the law... John 1.17 was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. So looking at that whole little list, and I, we sat here for a while, but it was intentional. Verse 9 parallels the first half of the Ten Commandments, and then the last part of verse 9 and verse 10 parallels the second half of the Ten Commandments. The first half of these and the Ten Commandments relate to God. The second half of this list and the Ten Commandments relates to each other in how we love. And it's a perfect parallel. What is the goal of our instruction? Love. And Jesus said, Matthew 22, 36, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. First half of the ten. And then he says, and the second is like it, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two, loving God and loving people, on these two... The, the whole law and commandments depend. Everything else comes right back to those two, which Jesus beautifully simplifies and says, if you will focus on loving God and loving each other, you're going to keep the commandments. So you don't sit there and memorize the top ten and the rest of the 613. You just pour your heart out for God and for other people, and the commandments start to take care of themselves. That's the motivation. Now, you might read this list and, and think, Wow. Okay, first of all, we're only in verse 11 and you've been going almost an hour. I know. You might read the list and say, Paul's really getting after people. And from maybe a not taking the time to walk through this like we have, you might read through the list or someone might read it and go, come on, Paul, who are you to call us out? You know, what right do you have to, to get all up in our face about our sin and our rebellion? Hey, Paul, what about you, man? Well, Paul says in verse 12, I think Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Yeah, whatever, Paul. Oh, keep reading. Verse 13, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Paul could say, I am one to talk. I'm not coming at you pointing the finger at how horrible your sin and rebellion is, I'm coming as one who is sinful and rebellious. I am speaking from my own heart, my own life. Paul could say, this was me. I was as guilty as anyone. In fact, Paul goes further than that. He continues and says, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. Pause there just for a second. You have friends and family members who are not believers in Jesus. You know what they're doing? They're acting ignorantly and in unbelief. So don't judge them for it. Recognize they don't know what they're doing. It's what Jesus said from Calvary when he was up on the cross. Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. And I think as Christians, we ought to remember that when we're talking to non-Christian friends and family, say, hey, they don't know what they're doing. So don't expect them to act like you think we're supposed to act morally. They're not going to. Just introduce them to Jesus. Just love them the way Jesus loved you. And the more we love and the more we talk about grace and the more we bring them, you know, understanding of Jesus and the gospel, all of those wrong thoughts and that ignorance and that unbelief, that's going to change. That's going to, over time, they'll realize that themselves. You don't have to tell them that. You don't have to give them the list. In fact, remember who Paul is writing this list to. Timothy. Timothy, this is a godly man. Timothy had it going on where the Spirit was concerned. And Paul's writing the list to him, saying, remember, this is the deal. Well, continuing further. I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. 
And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. And then he says in verse 15, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost. It's one of my favorite things that Paul says. For one thing, verse 15 is the mini gospel. It's the whole gospel in one verse. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. That's it. Of whom I am the foremost. I am the protos is the Greek word. Protos meaning the first or the chiefest. It's Paul's way of saying, I am big chief sinner man. <laughs> That's me. I love the King James translation, 1 Timothy 1.15. This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Why did God choose Paul? Because he was a brilliant Jew? No. In fact, God, he was a brilliant Jew, but God chose him and sent him to the Gentiles. How could he relate to them? He was a perfect Jew. He was not a perfect Gentile. He hated the Gentiles, and God said, I got a job for you. I want you to go to the Gentiles. Kind of like he said to Peter, stupid fisherman, I'm going to send you to the Jews. What? Would, would any of us have done that? Paul would have been my pick to go to Jerusalem and work on the Jewish Christians. And Peter, maybe, I would have picked to send out and go out and deal with the Gentiles because he really wasn't all that. I mean, he was Jewish, but he was a fisherman. He was a sailor, right? I mean, come on. That's the logic of man, but his logic is not our logic. Please remember that, that your strengths and your gifts and what you think you bring to the table may not be what God uses at all. He may choose you to do something you never would have expected to do because when you do it, people know <laughs> that's got to be God. That can't possibly be this person. I remember uh, some of you guys know Lisa ate a lot. I, I, this was so funny to me that when she came, came over to our house one time and she had sat under my teaching as Pastor Rick. And she walked into the house to talk to Cheryl and she looked over and I was there on my iPad, iPad playing Plants vs. Zombies. <laughs> and she looked at me and she went, Oh my goodness, it really is the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh as I'm saying that. <laughs> you know, he uses us in our weakness. He chose a kid who was born with a cleft palate and a cleft lip to preach the gospel. For goodness sakes, really God? There are other things I have that I could have brought to the table much more effectively than teaching. That's the way it is with the Lord. He gets the credit. He gets the glory. We look at the person and go, yeah, that's God. <laughs> that's certainly not you. And Paul describes himself blasphemous, persecuting steamroller. I know your Bibles say violent aggressor, but that's I, the best translation I can come up with is steamroller. The word is hubristes, where we get our word hubris, prideful. You know, it literally, hubristes describes someone who trashes other people for their own advancement. So a steamroller. He just rolled over anybody. And when the church came along, he was steamrolling the church. And God said, that's my guy. That is my guy. Why did God choose Paul to do what Paul did? Verse 16, for this reason I found mercy. So that in me as the foremost... Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Translation, if he can save me, Paul might say, he can save anybody. And that's your witness. That is your testimony. It is not how good you are. It is, man, listen, if God can save me, he can save you. I know where you're coming from. I was far worse. I look in the mirror every day and wonder, how in the world did you save me, God? But he did. And if he can do that, he can save you. And I'll tell you something. I think it is the height of all human hubris to say that God can't save me. That is ultimate pride. I'm too bad. I am beyond the reach of the eternal, awesome God. Really? Really you are? There is nobody who can sin so bad that God can't save them. And there's nobody so good who doesn't need to be washed by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus said in John chapter 3, Truly I say to you, unless you are born again, 
you cannot see the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of Spirit is Spirit. Don't be amazed that I said you must be born again. And so Paul could say, that's me. I'm the example. Big chief sinner man. And then Jesus stops me on the road to Damascus and suddenly Paul becomes becomes born again child of God. And that's how it works. I'm the example. And we are that. When you come to God, part of the deal, part of your salvation and why you're still here after you get saved is that by living saved, you are now a living, breathing, walking example of grace. That you can say to other people, yeah, no, there's no way I will ever be good enough to go to heaven. But Jesus saved me and can do the same for you. Ten times, and it's interesting to me, ten times, either directly or indirectly, from verse 12 through verse 17, Paul refers to Jesus. Ten times. Why is that impressive? Because he just went through the Ten Commandments. And we have a great contrast. You can go by the law, the Ten Commandments, try to live it out. Good luck. Or you can come to Jesus Christ, who cancels out every debt of law and sin against you and saves your life. It is Jesus, not you. I will say it again. Jesus, not you, is the source, the sole source of eternal life. Verse 17. Now... To the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul just busts out a praise song. He didn't even have time to grab his guitar. He just starts singing a praise song. I don't know if he was singing, but this sure sings. In fact, it was a praise song years ago. I used to sing it now. Unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So we, we sing this song. Great song. Paul wrote it. And I, I kind of get a sense that maybe Paul was, was speaking and he had his uh, amanuensis, his, his scribe, jotting down everything he's saying. And all of a sudden, Paul just goes, man, God save me. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He just busts out and the guy goes, oh, that's good. That's good. I'm going to jot that down here. The spontaneous doxology, as Paul just blurts it out. Note this. Wait a minute. Unto the King. In the New Testament, when we see the word King, it almost always applies to Jesus. Right? So, oh, so he's talking about Jesus. What about eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God? Hmm. John 1.18 tells us no one has seen God at any time. He's invisible. He's spirit. It says the only begotten God, that's Jesus, who's in the bosom of the Father, has explained him. Hebrews 1.3, he, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. So the question is, is the little blurt of praise, the doxology here, is it for the Father or for the Son? Yes, (laughs) exactly. Yes, it is. Verse 18, this command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Remember, we were talking about heresy, and that's still in the backdrop here. And he says, among these, and Paul unusually names these guys. He doesn't always do that. He does a couple of times, but it's got to be bad for Paul to write a name. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. Now stay with me just a little longer here. Hymenaeus and Alexander we don't know much about. They're named here, but we do know their self-indulgence was legendary at Ephesus. These guys are among the savage wolves. These guys are among the ones who are doing damage and destruction by their heresy there. And so Paul literally names them. Timothy would read it and know. And this letter probably was read by Timothy to the church at Ephesus. So these guys are going to be called out. I'm not a pastor who does that. I, I don't call out names from the pulpit. Some, sometimes that, some churches will do that. I'm, just, I'm not comfortable with that. i got a problem with you. I'll come tell you. If you have a problem with me, please don't call me down when I'm in the pulpit. But, but Paul does.
does this. Hymenaeus and Alexander, these guys. 2 Timothy chapter 2. So now, five years later, Paul is writing again. And he says, avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. He's repeating himself. Their talk will spread like gangrene. And among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. I don't know what the story is, but from the first letter to five years later, the second letter, Hymenaeus is still running around messing people's theology. He's still confusing people. He would be like those in Thessalonica who are being told that the day of the Lord had already come. He's saying the same thing. All the resurrections happen. You missed the rapture. You're done. We're just going to have to suffer through this. And Paul's saying he's a false teacher. And he still calls Hymenaeus out. Alexander. We don't know hardly anything about There are five Alexanders that are listed in the New Testament. Um, they are probably not the same guy. It was a very common Greek name. Alexander the Great. I mean, you can see it would be handed down. We use that name, Alexander. Kind of like the name Rick today. It's a great name in, in our culture. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, says Alexander the coppersmith. So again, five years later, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm, and the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. That may be the same Alexander that he mentions here. Point is this. In First Timothy, Paul says, I've handed him over to Satan. In Second Timothy, they're still causing problems. They're still there. What does it mean that he handed them over to Satan? Probably what Paul's saying is, I I disfellowship them. This is one of the few instances in Scripture where we see someone excommunicated, if you will. Put outside the body, and when you're put outside of the domain of the church, then what you are effectively put into is the domain of Satan. You're outside of the covering, the protection of the church. You're put out into the world. But this is what we've got to understand, and I think the church has failed at this many times. The purpose of disfellowship is always for restoration. You put them out so that you can bring them back. You don't put them out so you don't have to deal with them anymore. You don't kick them out and say, okay, good, we're done with that. Now we can be clean sheep. Because he was getting his dirt on the rest of us. That's not how it works. If a, a situation gets that extreme where someone has to be asked not to be there, you don't just boot and say, see ya. It's for the hope that they will realize how serious the sin is, and they will come to repentance. And then the second they say, I'm sorry, I don't want... Okay, great, come on, we got you. You repent, you're here. We we will walk this out with you. And I'll tell you this, it does not matter how horrendous or horrific the sin is, if there's repentance. We will work with that. And we are called to as the church. But if there's no repentance, it doesn't matter how little the sin may seem. If there's no repentance, you can't work with that. So Paul says, put them out. He did it one other time. It's in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5. You can read about that. But he uses the same phrase, I decided to to deliver such a one over to Satan. You're out from under the cover of the church. So Hymenaeus and Alexander, they're out. But so that they can be brought back. My suspicion, and I'm totally just reading it as speculation, it's vain speculation right here. My suspicion is, Paul said, put them out, and they did. But the guys repented and were brought back in. And five years later, they're doing stupid stuff again. And so Paul has to call them out again. That happens too. Why would you bring the guy back into the church? He's just messing things up. I know, but we're called to forgive. We're called to restore. Sometimes restoration needs to be done a couple or three times before it starts to take. And so that's the patience of, of God. Well, last thing, we'll finish with this. We finish with Timothy. If you look again at verse 18, this command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience. How do you fight the good fight? By a prophecy. Because that's what Paul said. By the prophecies made, use that to fight the good fight. What does that mean? Three times, Paul will refer to the prophecies made over Timothy. 
the prophecies when they laid hands on Timothy. In fact, I'll read these to you. 1 Timothy 4.13, Paul says, Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through the prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the elders. Do you get it? They laid hands on him, they prophesied over him, and the prophetic word for Timothy was, teach the word. You are being given, Timothy, the gift of teaching. Paul says, by those prophecies that were given to you, fight the good fight. Timothy's greatest weapon was the teaching of the word of God. Doctrine in relationship. Knowing the people, being among the people, and teaching, which was his gift. 2 Timothy 2, verse 6, for this reason, here's the third time, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. It's the teaching of the word. Teach the word, Timothy. In fact, 2 Timothy 4, 2, preach the word in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. 2 Timothy 2.15, and I'll give you the King James Version just because I like it. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Timothy, it's your gift. Timothy, speak that gift. Teach the word in relationship, and you will combat heresy. You will fight the good fight. And it just reminds me once again how vital the word of God is to us maintaining a sound relationship with him, and with each other because the goal of our instruction is love amen Amen. let's pray and Rachel come on up Father thank you for your word and I pray you will just fill us up I've gotten to go through this twice now thank you Lord what a cool thing and to think about this and, and Father I ask now for application your spirit knows how to apply these things way beyond our understanding and in a way that, that just comes to us and you show us. And I pray through the, the rest of this week, Lord, that as my brothers and sisters and as I walk day by day, you will bring these words to life in us. And that we will be like Paul, living saved in front of other people. An example that if, Lord, if you can save me, you can save anyone. Thank you for your word. Now, Lord, seal it to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.